Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day, and we thank You for Your many rich blessings to us. We thank You for this Lord's Day, and we acknowledge that while within this world, everything seems to run together, and one day seems to be like the one before it, and the next one after it, and yet, we acknowledge, though our hearts and minds are often captivated by the things of this world, this day is different. This is Your day the day that is set apart for worship of You, and for us to focus our hearts and our minds upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so this Christian Sabbath is the day in which we rest in Christ. We pray today that as we continue our study of You and the doctrines according to Your Word, that You would not only teach us, but You would also use this time of training to prepare our hearts for worship of You. We pray that you would guide and direct us by your Spirit. And so we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're continuing on our study uh, of the study called Studying God. Uh, I guess I needed to come up with a, a unique name as opposed to J.I. Packer's Knowing God. Uh, but by now you've probably noticed some similarities uh, again, as I said when we started this study, I'm, I'm drawing uh, heavily from Terry Johnson's book, The Identity and Attributes of God. Uh, and I also told you when we started this study and then emphasized last week that my intention is, is to teach the doctrines of God, uh, but also tie it in at a practical level. Uh, the Puritans referred to this as the ex experiential aspect of it. In other words, you're, you're not just uh, taking a, a systematic theology class uh, for your academic learning, but this is to impact our Christian life. Now, as soon as I say this, uh, it's really difficult to get all of the information in and tie it in uh, for the practical side of it. And so I'm just going to draw your attention today to this part one uh, part two, which Lord willing will be next week, uh, I'm going to spend a lot more time on the practical side of it. Uh, but today, in order to introduce this topic, uh, I'm going to need to spend a little bit more time on uh, the theology and our, our general understanding of the Trinity and what God's Word teaches us about our triune God. And so that's going to be my focus today. So it works like this. Because it's a two-part series, you've got to come back next week. Uh, and get part two, the practical side of it. Uh, so you, you bear with me as we walk through this. What is the Great Commission? What does the Great Commission say? Baptizing? Okay. All right. And? And to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So again, completely go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And I want to just start with that, because it's a verse that's familiar to most of us, and yet those verses that are most familiar to us oftentimes we can just do a flyover over the theology that's contained within them, can't we? Uh, the most often overlooked verse is often John 3.16, uh, because it's oftentimes the one, that, the one that we're most familiar with. And this is similar to that. And I want to start with <clears throat> looking at this, and I want to focus on this aspect of the Great Commission. And that is the name. And we're going to come back and we're going to look at the rest of this, but I want to look at this first part, the name. And interestingly enough, in the Greek language, this noun is singular, not plural. This is a singular name, not plural. In the name of, and yet what proceeds from this is names, plural. I'll also draw direct your attention and, and, and allow me to just nerd out for just a moment that in front of each of these is the definite article. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. At a church 
that I worked at uh, before previously. Uh, I had worked with a, a guy that was a, a youth minister, and he was describing to me one time his mode of, of baptism. And in that uh, church, it was it was a Baptist church, and so the mode of baptism was immersion. And uh, he basically told me that uh, I get up there and make it as fast as I can to get it done as quickly as I can. Um, true story. And, uh, and I said, really? And, and he said, well, just watch. And he was doing a baptism coming up. And he, and he got up there and, and he said, uh, and, and I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Boom! Get her done. And out he goes. I thought, well, that's the fastest thing I've ever seen in a dunking tank. And, um, and, and, it, and it bothered me. But it wasn't until later that I began to study the Trinity that I, became, uh, that I became aware just how bad that was. And it wasn't just because he was Speedy Gonzalez. It was because he had left out the definite articles of the Great Commission. And here's why this is important. Because the name, singular, is referring to this person. The name is referring to this person. The name is referring to this person. And these persons is the name of God. And I've intentionally conjugated the verb to be as is to draw your attention to that. What did Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 say? Part of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is three. He's one. One God. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to come to that. Hold, hold that thought, and uh, we'll look at that when we look at the Old Testament. Uh, but the name here is followed by three names, if you will, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is interesting. I want to read to you a quote from B.B. Warfield, that old 19th century Princeton Presbyterian scholar. Warfield said, He could not, and that is He being Jesus, He could not have been understood otherwise than as substituting for the name of Jehovah or you might today in our uh, translation, you might say Yahweh. That is the Old Testament name of God. And that era translated as Jehovah within our understanding of the Hebrew language translated as Yahweh. So he, he says he could not have been understood otherwise than as substituting the name of Yahweh, this other name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And this could not possibly possibly have meant to His disciples anything else than that Jehovah, that is Yahweh, was now to be known to them by the new name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Warfield goes on in that text and notes that the doctrine of the Trinity cannot be naturally deduced. We don't look out at nature. We don't look out at creation. We don't, within our own capability, <clears throat> come up with this concept. Some have tried and have erred in trying to think that somehow the doctrine of the Trinity is conveyed anywhere else but where? Scripture. It is divine revelation. We understand the doctrine of the, tr the, doctrine of the Trinity exclusively by virtue of the revelation of God in Holy Scripture. Now, admittedly, the doctrine of the Trinity is a difficult doctrine. But here's where we need to be careful. Some have in the past said, well, it's a difficult doctrine, so I don't need to think about it. It's a difficult doctrine, so I don't need to understand it. It's a difficult doctrine, so why don't I move on to something that is less difficult. And yet what I want to argue today, and I believe Scripture argues, is that yes, it's a difficult doctrine, and it is a vital doctrine. One and the same. Difficult and vital. The Trinity is not defined explicitly in Scripture, and yet 
it is revealed throughout. And let me explain what I mean by that, in case that bothers you. What does Scripture explicitly or principally teach? What does Scripture explicitly teach? Number one, the Bible teaches that there is one God. This is undeniable. There is one God. And I, when I'm using the term Scripture, I'm referring from uh, Genesis to Revelation. I'm talking about the full canon of Scripture, Old and New Testaments. Number two, the Bible teaches that the Father, Son, and the Spirit are each God. And I'm going to use this by saying three persons, one God. And I'm going to elaborate on this in just a second. But, but Scripture refers to God the Father as God. God the Son as God. God the Spirit as God. We see that through Scripture. And number three, the Bible teaches that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are each distinct persons. And God. The Bible teaches that there is one God. The Bible teaches that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each God. And the Bible teaches that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are each distinct persons. So what do we do with this? If that's what the Bible explicitly states, what do we do with this? Does anyone remember uh, many moons ago when we studied the Westminster Confession of Faith? And do you remember there is a key phrase in the very first chapter of the Westminster Confession regarding what to do with difficult doctrines when something is explicitly taught within Scripture? Do you remember what it says? It says, therefore by good and necessary consequence, we deduce there is, in this case, one God in three persons. What's the confession getting at when it uses that term, by good and necessary consequence? What do they mean by that? Yeah, it's a sound deduction. You look at it, and Scripture explicitly says this, and so what am I to do with this? Well, by logical deduction, by good and necessary consequence, to use their terminology, I understand what we understand as the Trinity. Now, I want to go back to, to the, the point that Hilda made, and I want to look at a couple of areas where we see the Trinity in the Old Testament. Now, <clears throat> question, trivia question, uh, is the word Trinity used anywhere within the Scriptures? No. Is the Trinity taught explicitly within the Old Testament? No, it's really not. Uh, we do see uh, that there will be, and I'm going to show you, we do see that it is revealed in Scripture, but when I use the word explicit, it would be as if, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. That that's, that's explicit, right? But there are some places where we're going to see that the Trinity is revealed to us, and we're also going to see some areas where the New Testament writers are going to draw from that which was veiled in the Old Testament, and they're going to draw it out, and it's going to be explicit in the New Testament. For example, as Hilda pointed out just a minute ago, the name for God, that, that Hebrew uh, word transliterated into English, Elohim, which is one of the names of God, is plural, not singular. Isn't that interesting? Why would it be stated as plural? In the beginning, you remember this, Genesis 1, God, Elohim, the Hebrew word there, they, if we were to use a pronoun, in the beginning, they created the heavens and the earth. Then God said in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, Let me make man in my image. He didn't say that, did He? And it's rightly translated, Let us make man 
in our image, after our likeness. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Number two, the word translated one, the Hebrew word ekad, in the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, is one of unity, not isolation. Not a stark singular entity, but an entity of unity. In other words, Echad is not isolated as if a monk goes up into the mountains, rolls a boulder across the door, and lives and dies alone. That Hebrew word cannot be used for that example. But it is a word expressing a unity, and we would deduce a unity of persons. Number three, there three is a common liturgical formula in the Old Testament. Don? Yeah, that's it. That's one of the that's one of the uses of it in Genesis. That's right. If you couldn't hear Don, he said that that Hebrew word is used when it refers to Adam and Eve becoming one flesh. Hmm? Yeah, composite or unity. That's a, that's an excellent point. I should have added that scripture verse. If I didn't have it in your handout, I should have put it in there. But that is that where that Hebrew word is used, and so we know that the two become one flesh in that union. And so that Hebrew word is an expression of singularity in unity. All right. Number three, <clears throat> as I said, there is a common liturgical formula. We hear in no, Numbers, for example, or rather the best example is in Isaiah. And what, what, what do the, 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 uh, the angels uh, cry out in the throne room? Holy, holy, holy. We see that again in Numbers chapter 6, that same combination, and yet there it is used as the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And in that case, it's Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh, or Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. And so in that, that liturgical form, we typically don't see it in twos or fours. Typically we see it in the number three, which theologians over the years have considered significant. Number four, there is a curious reference within the Old Testament to this person. The angel of the Lord. Who is he? His early church fathers argued that he was the, the pre-incarnate Christ. Others have argued that he is a, a messenger, an angelic messenger, who carries with him this authority given through God. Here's something interesting. The angel of the Lord... Uh, as referenced in Genesis chapter 3, uh, it says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows... Uh, that is the wrong scripture reference. Did I, do I have a different scripture reference on your handout? That's meant to be used somewhere else. Genesis chapter 3, verses 2 and 5. Yeah, that's probably what I meant to have in there. Well, it's there. I don't have it printed on my handout. Uh, but the reference to the angel of the Lord uh, is sometimes identified as God. Not exclusively, and this is not a hard doctrine, but we can see that there appears to be a presence of God in this what is referred to as the angel of the Lord. Number five, if it seems like I'm going quickly here, I am. This is intentional uh, because I'm going to get us to the New Testament so we can look at some of the tie-ins with the Old. So bear with me. Number five, the Word, wisdom, and the Spirit are sometimes distinguished in person from God. Think about, for example, Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs, uh, we know that wisdom comes from God, but in Proverbs we see that there are specific areas where wisdom, we could, we could capitalize it for example, to say that, that, that wisdom is personified. 
And so it's distinguished as different. And number six, the prophesied Messiah is to come in the name of God and be God, and yet is Emmanuel, which means God with us, is to be our righteousness, as described in Jeremiah 23, and is, present tense, mighty God and eternal Father. Now, if Jesus is not God, then how can He, who came as the one fulfilling this prophecy, be referred to as mighty God and eternal Father? And so we see a union here of terms within the Old Testament that reveal to us, not explicitly, but begin to trickle out, if you will, information to us about our triune God. Therefore, B.B. Warfield says that although not explicit, we find in the Old Testament, quote, at least the germ of the distinctions in the Godhead afterward fully made known in the Christian revelation. And so we're going to see in, in the re revelation of the New Testament that that which is veiled within the old, we see revealed more clearly to us in the new. So let's look here. That is, the Trinity revealed to us in the New Testament. And I want to start with this. The New Testament reveals the distinctive, redemptive roles. The distinctive, redemptive roles of God. Now, what do I mean by that? Fancy theological word, now tell me what I mean. <laughs> distinctive, redemptive. What, what do we mean by that? Well, I'm really just meaning the terminology. Distinct means different, right? I mean, just, huh? Particular, that's right. Yeah, particular, different, distinct, uh, and redemptive. We're, we're meaning in, return, in terms to uh, referring to uh, God's redemptive work or His work of salvation, right? And so, so think about it this way, what we see in the New Testament. First of all, we are saved by God's, God the Father's, electing and planning, or we could use the word ordaining there, His electing and planning love. God's electing and planning love. I said John 3.16 earlier, a verse that we oftentimes quote or may have memorized and we skip right over it. Look for this doctrine, that is the doctrine of God's electing and planning love. Listen to it for, for it in this verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten or only unique Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life or everlasting life. Or think about in John chapter 6, where Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the, one, the will of Him who sent me. And so we see within the New Testament, and I might add, if you're wanting to, to look at this for your own study, uh, the Gospel of John is full of, of these distinctions. And so that would be a good, uh, one of the first four Gospels to read and a greater study of this. But we don't just see that, we also see that we are saved by the sons sacrificing and accomplishing love. The Son sacrificing and accomplishing love. Think about Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives with me, within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who did what? Who loved me 
and gave himself for me. And there are, of course, a myriad of verses where we see this. For example, in Philippians chapter 2, referring to Jesus' humility, it says that, that he, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Jesus didn't have to work at being God. He is God. And so it wasn't anything that he had to earn or come to the world and, and, and merit in some way. Uh, he has always been God. He is God. He forever will be God. Number three, we are saved by the Spirit's applying and enabling love. The Spirit's applying and enabling love. If you've ever read uh, John Murray's book, uh, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, um, this is sort of the gist of, of that book uh, that he lays out for us. It's not original to, to Murray, and we can see it in Calvin's writings as well. But, but he does a good job at walking through this. And for our purposes of studying the Trinity, just to put it simpli simplistically, we st see our God at work, our one God at work, as revealed in the New Testament in at least these areas, but specifically these areas as they pertain to our redemption. God's electing and planning love, the Son's sacrificing and accomplishing love, the Holy Spirit's applying and enabling love. And what we mean by that is, is that the Holy Spirit is applying to God's elect that which Christ has accomplished upon the cross, and the Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to live out in, in our life in Christ. And so those are three distinct areas where we see within the New Testament uh, these distinct redemptive roles. Or just consider, if you will, Titus chapter 3. And if you want to turn there, you can, or I'll read it out loud to you. But I want to read to you Titus chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 4 through 7. And I want you... If you're following along, listen closely. If you're not, listen closely to my words. Quote, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We hear within that passage of Scripture each of these three redemptive roles. And, and let me add here real quickly, uh, because I think we studied the doctrine of the Trinity so little, that, that sometimes um, we're not as familiar with these doctrines. Um, so like, I'm not teaching anything new, and I'm not teaching anything Presbyterian. Um, this is straight down the fairway Christian doctrine. So if this sounds new to you, well, shame on us as a church for not teaching these doctrines more clearly and more often. Uh, these are the basic, fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. And it's what distinguishes us from heretics. Number two, the New Testament reveals the shared, as opposed to distinctive, it also reveals the shared divine attributes of God. The shared divine attributes of God. And what do we mean by this? Obviously, in distinction, <laughs> distinction from distinction, and different from, from distinction, these are where we see that the uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit share within these attributes. And the first place that we see this is in divine names and titles. Divine names and titles titles. And let me give you a few examples. And this is part of the reason why I went through quickly uh, some of the other uh, section to get to this, to make sure that we have time to look at this. 
For example, Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see within that introduction a reference to the Father and to the Son, the reference to God and Lord brought together in one introduction. Or how about John chapter 1 and John chapter 14? Most of us know John chapter 1, right? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and, wait for it, and the Word was God. Right? Or as it elaborates in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. What kind of glory, John? Glory as the only Son of God from the Father, full of grace and truth. Or 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. <laughs> the tying together there. Or Titus chapter 1. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Am I wearing you out here? I took it easy on the notes. I got way more verses and references. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? And so over and over again, we see the divine uh, uh, titles, or rather, was that supposed to be divine names? I never got that in there, did I? Where's Patty when I need her? Divine names and titles of God's attributes. Secondly, we see the divine attributes are applied. These divine attributes applied to each person of the Godhead. Let me give you an example. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our consciences from works to serve the living God? And what do we see in, in that example? We see the attributes of God applied to the persons of the Godhead. Or for example, Revelation chapter 2. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. For whose name's sake is the church doing this? The name of God. The name of Christ. As we see in the Great Commission, and also in Romans chapter 15, it says in verse 19, "...by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Elycrium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ." And so forth and so on. Number three, we see the divine works of God. We see the divine works of God. For example, creation, providence, redemption, judgment. I mean, just think about your own personal reading of the Scriptures, and you can immediately think, off just the top of your head, of several of the areas in which we see these div the divine works of God attributed to persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me give you just a couple. Colossians chapter 1. For by Him, that is Christ, for by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Those divine works are attributed to whom? To Christ. Or think about Hebrews, the first three verses of Hebrews. Long ago, and many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, who has God spoken through? By His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Which is an echo of Colossians chapter 1, isn't it? He goes on to say, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power, etc., etc. And I've got several other verses there for you to use in your continued study, but I need to go on. Number four, we see the shared divine attributes in divine honor. Divine honor. Well, let me explain what I mean by that. For example, in John chapter 5, Jesus says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Referring to Himself, right? And then He goes on to say that all may honor the Son. In other words, what He's saying is, is that there is purpose within the Godhead that our one God, that God the Father, has given honor to God the Son. Jesus goes on to say, just as they honor the Father, so Jesus is honored. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. And of course, these were condemning words to the Pharisee, scribes and Pharisees, wasn't it? But it's also a reminder to us as well that we honor God in honoring Christ. And then in John chapter 17, verse 5, And now the Father glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. In other words, Jesus' glory, which is revealed but for a moment in this section of Scripture, has been and is His glory for eternity past. And so it is for eternity future, if you'll use that terminology. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or rather 15. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. And Paul goes on to make his argument about the necessity of the gospel. But what is the basis of his argument? The basis of his argument is the divinity of Christ. Or in Romans chapter 9, I am speaking with the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. We see over and over and over again, and I think, and I could be wrong and you may disagree with me on this, but I think that for those of us that read our Bibles regularly, I think that seeing these tie-ins becomes so commonplace, and in a certain sense I think that's good, but also becomes so commonplace that we can miss the majesty of our triune God. And I think it's, it's a distinct problem within the, the church. And what I'm trying to do in walking through this and making this a two-part study instead of just one part is to draw your attention to it. I, I want it to, to leap off the page as you read your Bible this week where you see over and over and over again how God has revealed His triune persons within Scripture. The Westminster Larger Catechism, which I know you all know well because we just finished studying it, the Larger Catechism says in question 11, or it asks the question, how doth it appear that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father? Answer, the Scriptures manifest that the Son and the Holy Ghost 
are God equal with the Father, ascribing unto them such names, such attributes, such works, and worship as are proper to God only. And you can see I'm drawing from that catechism question in drawing your attention to these. Am I not? Drawing your attention to their distinct redemptive nature, their shared divine attributes, and thirdly, the distinct persons. The distinct persons. And I've got a number of scripture references here for you. On your handout, I'll just draw your attention to a few. In John chapter 17, Jesus says in verse 11, And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Did Jesus just say that He and the Father are one? Yes, He did. That's as explicit as you find it here within the 17th chapter. But in verse 24, listen closely to this. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. And then listen to verse 26 of John 17. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now we don't have time to go into it today, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll get into this a little more deeply next week of, of the love that is enjoyed, the inter-Trinitarian love, theologians call it, uh, that is enjoyed between the persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But what I want to leave us with is two things. I'm going to read a quote to you from Calvin uh, that I think just helps us understand this, and then I want to give you a point that will take us across the street. Calvin said at his institutes, I cannot think on the one without quickly being circled by the splendor of the three. Nor can I discern the three without being straightway carried back to the one. Isn't that a beautiful expression? And I think, oh God, may that be how I read Scripture. When I see the glory of Christ, may I see the glory of the Godhead. When I see the glory of the Godhead, may I see the glory of Christ and of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. I want to end on this. I read to you that larger catechism question. Remember, that question was, how doth it appear that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father? And the answer was this, remember, the Scriptures manifest that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father, ascribing unto them such names, attributes, works, and worship that is proper to God only. And so you see, as we finish the study at this moment, we go across the street to worship our triune God. Our God who has ordained our salvation. Our Lord Jesus, who has accomplished our salvation. Our Holy Spirit, who has applied our salvation. And so I encourage you at this moment, pray now that what God has purposed and Christ has accomplished and the Holy Spirit applied, may they receive all the glory and all the worship from our hearts and our minds today. Let me pray for us. Our gracious God in heaven, we thank You for the teaching of Your Word and that which is revealed to us, not explicitly in the Old Testament, is revealed to us in the New. And we thank You for this revelation and we praise You. We pray today that You would prepare our hearts and our minds to worship You in spirit and in truth, according to Your Word as You have given it to us. And so we pray this as Your dependent children. In Jesus' name, Amen.